contain all things necessary to salvation and as being the rule and ultimate standard of faith. So Holy Scripture, the Apostles' Creed, as the baptismal symbol said Lambeth, and the Nicene Creed. Now I need to add to that that the church has also recognized the third creed, the Athanasian Creed. Uh, in fact, the Athanasian Creed is normally used on Trinity Sunday because it is one of the best explications of, of the Holy Trinity. Um, and so there are three creeds that the church uses, but two specifically. And then, of course, the what we call the dominical sacraments, the sacraments of baptism and the Holy Eucharist, with unfailing use of our Lord's words of institution and elements, which means you baptize with water in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You receive the Eucharist under the forms of bread and wine with the words of blessing that our Lord himself used at the Last Supper in the upper room. And uh, when we talk about the historic episcopate, that means the ministry of apostolic succession. That is what it's called for. Now let me just stop on that fourth point just a minute because a question was raised during our break and I said I would address it. <coughs> How has that succession been kept? And of course, the point here is that when a bishop is ordained and consecrated, other bishops lay their hands on that bishop's head and pray that he may receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit for that particular ministry. This is universal in the church. So far as the consecration of bishops and apostolic succession, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Coptic Church, the Anglican Communion, uh, the Old Catholics, all do the same thing. And of course, the Council of Nicaea, the first of the seven ecumenical councils, decreed that a bishop must be consecrated by at least three bishops. And there must be approval of the province. So there has to be, the person is, is an elected bishop, there is an approval of that election. And the bishop is consecrated by the laying of the hands. So there is a regular succession of bishops, just like uh, the apostles. Uh, they were called by Jesus. Jesus breathed on them. They received the Holy Spirit. They were given authority to act. And then they ordained their successors by the laying on of hands. And that succession is unbroken all the way from the apostles to here, today. Um, and I uh, really intended to bring a copy of that of one of those successions so that you could see that. But 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 it is the case, and it is true. And the question that was asked was, well, what, what about at the Reformation uh, when the Church of England and the Church of Rome were separated, and in the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII declared Anglican orders null and void. He said you lost the succession. And uh, what I said to him is is. Well, two things. First of all, you need to read uh, what Leo XIII said in his papal bull, but then you have to stop the curing. But then you have to read the response of the archbishops of uh, Canterbury and York. The point is, Leo XIII was theologically absolutely correct. The trouble is, Cardinal Vaughan, an Irish archbishop, and I hope there are no Irish who take offense at this, an Irishman who hated the English. Um, lied to the Pope about the facts concerning the consecration of bishops in England at the time of the Reformation. And, and that's clearly documented. And it, and it has to do with something that allegedly happened in Ireland, which, as it turns out, would make the full call. The original story that some of the Roman Catholics gave about uh, the consecration of bishops in England is after the break. Uh, under Henry VIII, yes, bishops were still consecrated in the same form and everything, uh, and that continued when uh, Mary came to the throne. But then when Mary died, and the Archbishop of Canterbury died on the same day, um, Elizabeth came to the throne, and uh, uh, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury had to be consecrated. And uh, what happened was a drunken monk 
laid a Bible on his head and said, Rise up, Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. None of this actually happened. He was actually consecrated by four bishops by the laying on of hands and praying the prayer of consecration. It's recorded in the, in the service book at Lambeth uh, Chapel, Lambeth Palace. Um, so that Nags Head Fable, because it's supposed to have taken place at Nags Head's Tavern, um, is a fable. Uh, well, of course, Leo did not rely on that. He relied on what Cardinal Vaughn told him, which was that there was no intent to continue the office of bishop, there was a, a lack of intention. And that in the consecration service, it didn't specify the person who was being consecrated bishop, who's received the Holy Ghost for the office and work. Now it says, a bishop who sins, you Forgive, they are forgiven, who sins you retain, they are retained to be the official dispenser of God's holy word and sacrament. Um, that didn't specify the office. And that there was no intent to consecrate. And so what Leo said was, the lack of intention invalidated the consecration. And by the time there was an amendment of the right, uh, in 1662 uh, to correct it so that the intention was clearly expressed, all valid bishops had died out. Because if I'm a valid bishop and I'm going to consecrate you a bishop, but I do not use a valid form, you're not a bishop. And if you then consecrate someone using that same invalid form, they're not a bishop. And if this goes on for two generations, all valid bishops have died out, right? Uh, well, in the, in, in the first place, as we know now from research of all the various forms of consecration used all over the world in different places, the form used by the Church of England in the 16th century was perfectly valid. In fact, it was more complete than the original Roman form used in Italy in the second century. Uh, but uh, what Leo did say was, by 1662, you now had a proper form. If only you had a valid bishop, then the succession could be restored, right? And that was a, that was one of the points that was made in the responsio to the, uh, to the uh, Apostolic Mercurial. Well, we don't rely solely on Anglican bishops in our succession, ever. Uh, a lot of the archbishops of Canterbury were actually consecrated in France by French bishops long before the Reformation. But after the Reformation, we had Eastern Orthodox, Old Catholic, and even Roman Catholic bishops taking part in the consecration of Anglican bishops. Most people don't know that in the middle of the 20th century, um, the Episcopal bishop of the, of the Rio Grande one of his co-consecrators was the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Santa Fe. In 1948, the Suffragan Bishop of Pennsylvania, one of his co-consecrators was an Eastern Orthodox Bishop. And back at the beginning of the 20th century, um, the uh, Episcopal Bishop of Cuba was consecrated by an old Catholic Bishop from Europe. And today, there are no Anglican bishops alive anywhere that are not in one of these successions. When I was consecrated in 1980, one of my consecrators was the Bishop of Northern Indiana, Bishop Sheridan. One of Sheridan's chief consecrators when he was consecrated bishop was the uh, Polish National Catholic Bishop of Chicago who is at the uh, Polish National Catholic Church, is in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. So even if we say Leo is right theologically, and even if we say, well, yeah, we would argue that he's wrong on, on, the, on the question of history about what happened, the point is it doesn't make any difference. 
And in fact, today, most Roman Catholic theologians would concede that Anglican orders are, even from their point of view, probably valid. And I would have to say, for an example, uh, when I was the rector of St. John's Church in Oklahoma City, I had a curate who left to become a Roman Catholic Benedictine monk at St. Gregory's Abbey in Shawnee, Oklahoma. And he was a priest. And he had been ordained to the priesthood in the Church of England by a bishop in this old Catholic succession as the rest of us were. And so when he was to be received and become a Roman Catholic Benedictine, he said, I asked to be received in my orders, not reordained, which the Roman Catholic Church normally would do. And, and the whole question was then submitted to Rome by the Roman Catholic uh, community, Benedictine community. The interesting thing is, the letter that came back from Rome said that Father Writing is to undergo ordination as a priest, after which he is permitted to resume his priesthood. <laughs> Ordained conditionally, not the no. So he was conditionally ordained, that is to say, well, we don't know whether you're valid or not. This is a conditional ordination. You may be a priest. But in any event, even Rome says, after that, he could resume the office of priest. Resume, not begin. We had a priest in the Diocese of Eau Claire, a retired priest, who was in a place where there wasn't any place for him to do anything for us, because there were other clergy there. So he went to the Roman Catholic Bishop of the Cross and said, you know, would you receive me into the Roman Church so I can function here as a priest? And the Roman Catholic Bishop contacted me, we were good friends, Bishop Freckman. And he said, what about this? I said, well, he does need to be doing something, and, and yes, we don't, and if you can use it, uh, I will release him. And he said, fine, you release him, and I will conditionally ordain him, <laughs> which will satisfy Roman canon. And then I found out later they did conditionally ordain him months after the organ functioned as a priest. And when he died, uh, I was asked to preach at his funeral in the Roman Catholic Cathedral of the Cross. And it was interesting when Bishop Brecky listed his work as a priest, he began with the work he did as an Anglican. He made no distinction between the parishes. This man has been a priest for this long that there is. And, uh, and we jointly buried him, and there we were. Uh, Graham Leonard, the Bishop of London, uh, left the Church of England uh, after the 1988 Lambeth Conference uh, over some of the issues that were there and became a Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholic Church conditionally ordained him. And, and, and that's been the case right down the line. There are tons of instances. And in some instances, uh, <coughs> being received. But it's not just the Roman Catholic Church. The Eastern Orthodox Church has been asked to deal with this question of the validity of Anglican orders. There's never been a final definitive statement from the Orthodox Church, but prior to World War II, a number of the Orthodox Churches took up the question of Anglican orders, and everyone that did came to the conclusion that Anglican orders were totally valid and proper. Uh, it would require a Pan-Orthodox Synod to make a final determination, and that's never happened. Every two or three years they say, well, in five years we're going to have the Synod. Well, I don't know, but time of the Synod will come before the end of the world. But, uh, <laughs> the Orthodox moves slowly. One time John Hopko was asked on the question of the ordination of women, said, why is the Orthodox haven't taken up that question? And he said, we move slowly. Well, when are you going to take it up? Soon, sometime in the next morning. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the point is that the, the Orthodox Church has never denied Anglican orders. The Old Catholic Church has recognized Anglican orders as valid. And uh, the Martoma Church in India has recognized the validity of Anglican orders. Uh, the 
Philippine and the Vedic Catholic Church has recognized Anglican orders. Uh, the Russian Orthodox Church to this day at, at one of the uh, assemblies of the Anglican Church in North America, uh, the uh, uh, primate of the Orthodox Church in America addressing our assembly said, just remember, we have never denied the validity of your orders. And at the present time, even the, the Patriarch of Moscow has said the same thing. And we look to the day that we can find a way of reunion. Uh, and so, I guess to answer the question, don't be unduly concerned about Lou with the 13th. Uh, like I said, he was an honest man. And given the information he was given, the decision he made fit the information, but the information was wrong. He was theologically correct that the ordination of the bishop has certain minimum standards, <clears throat> but he was wrong in saying that somehow that got lost. But even if he were right, Anglican orders have been clearly valid since at least 1919. Well, so we have these four points of the Lambeth Conference, and I want to talk about each one of them briefly because this is at the heart, really, of understanding what the Anglican Communion really is and believes. We believe that holy scriptures are the ultimate rule and standard of faith for Christians. We live by what holy scripture teaches us. Now, you have to be careful. You can misuse the Bible. There's a wonderful story about a little old lady who uh, always wanted to live by the Bible. So every morning she got up, she'd pick up the Bible, close her eyes, open the Bible, jab her finger down, and then she'd read whatever that was. That was what she was to do that day. And uh, one morning she got up and she opened the Bible, closed her eyes, clutched her finger down, and read Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> and she said, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so she said, I must have made a mistake. She tried again, and the second time, she opened the Bible, pushed her finger down, opened her eyes and read, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> and she said, surely that's not what God means. So a third time she tried it, and the third time, the text in St. John's Gospel says, whatsoever he commandeth of you, do it. That's not the way to read the Bible. <clears throat> but Holy Scripture can, can be the basis of our understanding of what God has revealed of Himself to us and recorded over the centuries. Uh, now, sometimes things in Holy Scripture can be hard uh, you know, we are called to, to as Christians, to uh, avoid sin, live a holy life. And we don't. Uh, there's that wonderful saying that even the saintliest of saints sins seven times a day. And there's a wonderful story they tell about the little old lady who prayed every day and she was praying one day and she says, Lord, protect me, keep me from sin. So far I've not committed any sins, but in a minute I've got to get up out of bed and start the day. <laughs> protect me. And a number of us, myself included, part of our discipline is to make our confession to God in the presence of a priest and receive absolution. And the point is when the priest pronounces absolution, at that point you are totally free of sin. Totally sinless. So when I go to confession, when I walk out of the confessional, I am absolutely pure and sinless and remain so for up to 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first thing I'm going to say, well, I went to confession. You didn't. I'm better than you. Right off the bat. <laughs> so we have to have this realization that we are all sinners in need of redemption. And that that's why God sent His only begotten Son into the world. That we could be drawn to the life of perfection through Him. <laughs> and that's all spelled out for us in the Bible. And so it's very important that we understand Holy Scripture 
is the rule and ultimate standard of faith for Christians. And we may not like what's in the Bible, but it's true. <clears throat> we may not want to do what's in the Bible, but we are called to. And that is extremely important, especially in this day and age, when you have people professing to be Christian who simply ignore Scripture or say, well, it doesn't mean what it says. Uh, I guess that could be kind of like a little old lady who pointed her finger in the Bible and that's the way she understood it. And you can have trouble. The point is, what does Holy Scripture mean? What does it teach? Christians have been dealing with this for 2,000 years and there's tons and tons and tons of material that point to it. And even in spite of the divisions in Christianity and sometimes arguments over what's in the Scripture, generally speaking, historically, there is a clear understanding of what Scripture is and says and means. And we have to come back to that. And nowadays, it seems that there is this great tendency to make Christianity what we want it to be and not what the Bible says it is. Now there are a lot of hard sayings in the Bible. But they're very true. And we have to understand them and follow them. Uh, and I say, as a lawyer, I run into situations in which there's stuff in the U.S. Constitution. I don't like, but it's in there. And as a lawyer, I've got to follow it, right? And that's important. And so what we say in the Chicago Lambeth Corner Rhino is Holy Scriptures are containing all things necessary to salvation. The second point is the creeds, that we accept the Apostles' Creed as the baptismal symbol. And, and let me talk just a minute about the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is a Western Creed. The Orthodox Church does not use it. They have no objection to it. They just have never used it. Because the Apostles' Creed was written at the close of the first century in the city of Rome as a brief statement to be memorized by those persons about to be baptized as adults. A lot of them couldn't read but they could memorize, and the Apostles' Creed was a brief statement of the Christian faith that they embraced. So for the Western churches, the Apostles' Creed has always been especially related to baptism. And if you look at the baptismal service, in the prayer books from 1549 on down to the 2019 New Prayer Book of the Anglican Church of North America, the Apostles' Creed is the baptismal creed. And if the person is able to recite it, they recite it. If they're not, their godparents recite it for them and, bow and bind themselves by it. The Apostles' Creed is the creed of baptism. As I say, the Eastern Church doesn't use it, but they have no theological objections, but it's just is something that was not part of their tradition. The Nicene Creed, on the other hand, is a product of... Uh, councils of the church and was drafted by two different councils dealing with theological issues that were dividing the church as a statement primarily on, on the person of Jesus Christ. But the Nicene Creed is adopted as the creed for the entire Christian church. It's used in the East and in the West. Now, I do have to say there's one point there of conflict. When you recite the Nicene Creed, mostly in the West, you talk about the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. That phrase, and the Son, is not in the text of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> the Nicene Creed is adopted by the councils of the church. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. That phrase, and the Son, was later added first by the German church, and then gradually throughout the West it was accepted. Rome was the last part of the Western church to finally allow that, uh, and the Son, to be inserted uh, in the creed. And the Eastern 
church's complaint says when a council takes an action, it can be changed or amended only by a later council. So when the Nicene Creed was adopted, you cannot change the text until a later council authorizes that change. So that phrase, and the son, cannot canonically be included in the creed. And they're right. Now, it's still used in the West, but it's interesting. Um, I remember attending the enthronement of the Archbishop of Canterbury in Canterbury Cathedral back in 1991. Um, and at that point, that phrase, and the sun, was omitted because there were ecumenical guests there from the East. The same thing was true when John Paul II was enthroned as Bishop of Rome. It was omitted. And uh, what the Russian Orthodox Church has said to the Anglican Church of North America, you got to take it out. And the College of Bishops of the Anglican Church of North America has adopted a declaration recognizing that while it has been inserted, there's no real authority for it, and it ought to be omitted. And uh, we've asked for the rest of GAFCON to deal with it. Two Lambeth conferences have said, yeah, it should be omitted. Not because it's theologically wrong. I have to say, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Greeks are the Greeks, aren't they? Uh, they say it's theologically error to talk about the double spiration of the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Uh, but everyone else, even in the Orthodox churches, uh, it's not theologically wrong, it's just canonically incorrect. <laughs> which is where we are. And that's the position. We've come to an agreement with the Russian Orthodox Church in that regard. That, uh, that's something we really have to look at. Um, there is a third creed. It's not mentioned here, but it is accepted in the church and we use it. That's the Athanasian Creed. How many of you ever have used or read the Athanasian Creed? Most of them. It's long, isn't it? Wouldn't you hate to have to memorize that? But, but it is a creed accepted by the church and used by the church, especially on Trinity Sunday, because it is an explication of the Holy Trinity. Um, the, the Athanasian Creed, um, again, the Orthodox have no uh, theological problem with it, but they don't use it, but Anglicans and Roman Catholics do. But the um, resolution speaks of the two creeds, uh, Apostles and Nicene Creed. Then we come to the sacraments. And I want to talk just a little bit about the sacraments. We, we say there are two dominical sacraments. And when we say dominical, we mean sacraments instituted by Christ. Christ instituted baptism. He gave us the form. We are to baptize with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord gives that to us specifically before his ascension, after his resurrection. So, and it is in baptism that we are made Christians. We are human beings. We were born human beings. But baptism is that which makes us Christians. That's why it's called the sacrament of new birth. We're born human, we're spiritually born Christian through baptism. And in the sacrament of baptism, when that water washes over us, it also washes away sin, original sin. And if we're old enough to have committed actual sins, it also washes away all actual sins that have not yet been forgiven. So the sacrament of holy baptism takes away sin. It it grafts us into the body of Christ and it makes us Christian. That's how we become Christian. And 
it is in baptism then that one is brought into this whole body. The Holy Eucharist is the other sacrament which our Lord commanded that we are to baptize all people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the first command that he gives us. The second he does at the Last Supper. When he takes the bread and wine, he says, do this for the recalling of thee, always. And, and what is the Eucharist? What does it involve? If you go back and read what our Lord did a, a year before he was in the upper room in that last Holy Week, when he was teaching in Capernaum, he says, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no eternal life. And everyone said, that's cannibalism, you're crazy. Even his disciples said, Lord, that's a hard saying, what do you mean? And you know that our Lord normally, whenever he did any teaching, he then set the apostles down and told them exactly what this meant. So that they would have no question. This time he didn't. When Peter says, Lord, this is a hard saying. What does it mean? And the other people are said, we can't follow this guy. Instead of explaining, Jesus will come and says, do you want to leave too? This is the truth. They did not understand, but a year later in the upper room when he instituted the Lord's Supper, they understood it. You see, this goes back to the symbolism, really. The symbolism that is tied to the Old Testament. The children of Israel ended up as slaves in Egypt. Remember? And then God raised up a man to lead the people out of slavery in Egypt. And you recall there were the, the, uh, all the plagues and everything that happened. And finally, Pharaoh allowed the children of Egypt to go. But what was it that freed the children of Egypt? God said to Moses and through him to the children of Israel, this night all of you take a lamb and you kill it and you smear the blood on the lintels and doorposts of your homes and then you roast the lamb and eat it. This will save you. This is the Lamb of God. And when the angel of death comes through Egypt, every place there's blood of the Lamb, he will spare. You are saved by the blood of the Lamb. That was originally what happened in Egypt with Moses. And the children of Israel were led out of Egypt. Of course, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. There's a funny story about that. Uh, well, uh, I'll get back to that. <laughs> when they were led out of Egypt, they took with them that understanding that it was the Lamb of God that saved them. <clears throat> and so, every year, they celebrated the great feast of the Passover, when the angel of death passed over the children of Israel and they were saved in the blood of the Lamb. And so, every Passover, there was a Lamb eaten by the people. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And He dies on the cross. And it is His blood that saves us, just as the blood of that Lamb saved the children of Israel 1,400 years earlier. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Remember what John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him who takes away the sins of the world. It's the blood of the Lamb that saves you. And Jesus is the Lamb. It's His blood that saves you. And how do we do that? We come together week by week for the Holy Eucharist, for the breaking of the bread, which is His flesh, and the taking of the cup of wine, which is His blood. If you want to look at it in one way, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to be a cannibal. <laughs> Think about it. You're eating the flesh of Christ and drinking His blood. And in that Last Supper in the upper room, He makes that perfectly clear. They're sitting there at what's called a Chabara meal. 
A chabara meal is the meal of a fellowship that comes together under its teacher or leader to show their unity. And there is a service. You can still find it in the, in the uh, Jewish prayer book. Uh, it's about 5,000 years old. But it starts out, you have this dinner, everyone's coming together like a dinner, like, I don't know if you belong to the Lions Club or the Columbus or whatever. You, know, you come together for fellowship meals. Or we have a banquet honoring somebody. But at the beginning, to show the unity of this group in, in the hollow loaf, uh, a loaf of bread is taken. And it is blessed by the teacher, leader. Blessed art thou, O Lord God, and our fathers, because of you we have this bread and this broken. And it's passed around the table, and everyone takes a piece off that one loaf to show that, though many, they are still one. And at that point, there's silence in the prayer, but Jesus inserts words into that, the Last Supper. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to recall me to you. We say in the, uh, in the prayer book, we say, do this in remembrance of me. Well, that word remember means, well, we think about it again. No, no. The word remember actually literally means putting back together the opposite of disremember. Remember. Remember. Bring me back to you for my unamnesis to make me with you again. And as I say, those words were inserted into the prayer, not there. And at the end of the meal, everyone has their own plate and their own glass of wine, but there is a special glass of a cup of wine called a cup of blessing. And a prayer is said over it very much, Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, because of you we have this wine through the vine. And it is passed around the table, and everyone shares in that cup of wine, again showing their unity. And again, in that silence, Jesus, the Last Supper, inserts his words, this is my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's what our Lord is saying there in that chapter on you. And now, what the apostles did not understand uh, a year before, they now begin to see. And after our Lord's death and resurrection and His ascension, the church comes together every Sunday and indeed at times in the New Testament every day for the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. The Holy Eucharist and Holy Baptism are intended to be used as our Lord demands. And we need to remember as baptism relates back to human birth and the water of birth and the water of rebirth in baptism and the Eucharist takes us back to the angel of death passing over Israel saving them from what happened to the firstborn of Egypt. So for us that's what we understand by those two sacraments. Those are what we call the dominical sacraments. Now, there are five other, as the articles of religion say, are commonly called sacraments. They're not the same because they're not specifically instituted by Christ and they're not generally necessary to salvation. Baptism and the Eucharist are necessary to salvation for everybody. But the others are sacraments for specific purposes. For example, there is a sacrament of confirmation. You're baptized. Normally, in a Christian world, you're baptized as an infant. But, but you still have to, even though your godparents, they make commitments for you, you have to take those commitments on yourself. And so, when you reach the age of reason, then you can be confirmed by the laying on of hands of the, of the bishop to bless you, to ask that the gifts of the Holy Spirit will be given to you, that you receive the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, that you are then incorporated there fully as a Christian. The sacrament of confirmation then confirms what 
commitment was made for you at your baptism and you now make it for yourself. Um, but it's not generally necessary to salvation. And then there is this sacrament, of course, of a holy matrimony. <clears throat> a man and a woman are joined together, and as our Lord taught, they are no longer two, but one flesh. This is what happens. Two people are brought together. A family is created. But marriage is not necessary to salvation. There are some that say, it's a hindrance to salvation. <laughs> but that's a joke. But marriage then is God's blessing of a particular estate for the family. And then there is the sacrament of unction. When one is sick, God provides for healing. And again, uh, uh, and this is spelled out in the, in the Epistle General of St. James. So, is anyone sick? Let him call the elders, the priests of the church that they come, and pray for them and anoint them that they may be healed. God does not want us to be sick. He wants to give us help. And the sacrament of unction is one of those ways by the anointing or the laying on of hands, the healing of God is given. But it's not necessary in salvation. It is a great help to your health and it's a wonderful blessing but it's not like the Eucharist or baptism. And then there is the sacrament of penance. Uh, and that is, we commit sins. And we are told in the Holy Scripture that if we commit sins, we must be sure to acknowledge them that we have received the forgiveness of God. We confess our sins. Uh, we don't have to confess to a priest, but it is clearly recommended that we should to receive not only absolution, but counsel and advice and direction. Uh, and our Lord specifically gave to his apostles the power to bind and loose, what are called the keys of the evening. Whatever uh, sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whatever sins you retain, they are retained. And that is, is part of the ministry of the priesthood is that absolution of sin or refusal to absolve if there's not true repentance. And finally, the sacrament of ordination. Uh, and while that's one of the seven sacraments and one of the five non-essential sacraments, nonetheless, in the fourth part of the Lambeth uh, quadrilateral, uh, it is made a very important specific thing. The historic Episcopal locally adopted in the methods of his administration to the very needs of the nations and peoples called of God for the unity of the church. It, it is a very scary thing to say the Episcopal, a bishop, a successor to the apostles is an essential part of the church. And that's certainly scary to me because I am really a very unworthy servant. I'm well aware of my imperfections. I'm well aware of my failures. And yet God has called me to be an apostle. And that is what we're saying, that in the church we must continue the apostolic office. It's essential to the unity of the church. Um, and that's been a real sticking point for some churches because they don't have bishops, they don't want to accept bishops. Well, the Presbyterians, for example, they exist because they are opposed to bishops. Although, what was someone telling the Presbyterians? She idiots. A presbyter is nothing but bishop writ large. <laughs> Your presbyters are just as bad as our bishops. Um, but those are the four essential minimum deposits of the faith. This is upon which the unity of the church depends. Holy Scriptures as the ultimate rule and standard of faith. The Apostles and Nicene Creeds as effectual statements of that faith. The Dominical Sacraments of Baptism and the Holy Eucharist as the means by which we are brought into that right relationship with Jesus. And the ministry of the historic Episcopal. 
This is the essence of the Catholic practice of the church. And that's why the Chicago Declaration specifically says, we do affirm that Christian unity can be restored only by the return of all Christian communions to the principles of unity exemplified by the undivided Catholic Church during the first ages of its existence. To be in unity, to be in fullness of the Christian faith, you have to be a Catholic. That's what we Anglicans say. But that gives us some idea then of the importance of the Lambeth Quadrilateral, those four points. And in the basis of our discussions of reunion with all other Christian bodies, that's been the starting point for all Anglicans. And it's interesting because when we began the dialogue in the 1930s with the old Catholic Church, the Utrecht Union, uh, that part of the Catholic Church under the Archbishop of Utrecht, the question was, what do you Anglicans understand as the essentials of the faith? And we took it through Lambeth Quadrilateral and we laid it out in the discussions and finally concluded, yeah, that's what we believe. That's the Catholic faith. And so the bond agreement was based on that, the Lambeth Quadrilateral. In our talks with others, that's it all in there. Back almost 50 years, more than 40 years ago, there was a meeting of virtually all Christian bodies in Lima, Peru, to look at this question of Christian reunion. I mean, you had Roman Catholics, Russian Orthodox, Albanian Orthodox, Anglicans from Canada, the United States, Great Britain, everywhere. You had Baptist, Southern and Northern. Uh, talk about differences. More than the Southern Baptists are quite different from each other. <laughs> but Methodists, uh, even Seventh-day Adventists, all kinds of Christians came together, and out of it came the Lima Declaration, uh, which is out there. It hasn't been formally adopted by all the churches, but their representatives also. This said, this is what we understand to be essential for Christian unity. Christianity, the church should all be one. It is, the four marks of the church is it's one, it is holy, it is Catholic, it is apostolic. And that unity is there even in spite of our human divisions, there is still a unity. But that has to be a visible unity. And the Lima Declaration is basically the Lambeth part of that. And that was, it. even the Roman Catholics said, yeah, that's essential to Christian unity. So, if we want to understand the Catholicity of the Church, we look first, then, at the Chicago Lambeth Declaration of Quadrilateral. That gives us the minimum essential deposits of the faith necessary for the 